Today is March 3rd, 2015, and my name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing Shabon Colonel in the Oklahoma Conference Ministry Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. This interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. It will also be available on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Shabon, we really appreciate you coming yeah, well, and visiting with us this morning. Uh, a little bit different from when we talked earlier. I want to ask you a little bit about your background. Can you share some information about where you grew up, you know, your parents, your childhood, some of your early formative experiences? Yeah. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma City, and I went to schools in, um, uh, in Shawnee, Oklahoma, which is just outside of uh, the city area here. My dad was an employee of the Indian Health Service and was deployed there. And so, and really, that's where most of my family was anyway, so that's where I was really brought up. Um, joined uh, the United Methodist Church when I was about the age of 12, when I was confirmed into to a full membership. Um, so I've been a lifelong member of this denomination and was a member of uh, one of our urban congregations that was formulated for uh, Creek and Seminole tribal members here in the, the greater Oklahoma City area. So that's kind of a, a historical tie that my grandmother had with the church. Um, but even before that, before they, rem they moved to urban settings, uh, my family comes out of uh, one of our historical Seminole churches located just north of Seminole, Oklahoma. And you sure a tribal affiliation with Creek or Creek and Seminole? I am Seminole and Creek. And prior to removal, we were of the same uh, tribal community. So. And that's a long history lesson. So you're uh, you're an ordained Methodist uh, minister, uh, elder. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you got your call to the ministry? Yeah, I actually I can. You said we only have an hour, so I don't know if uh, that's enough time. But uh, um, I was uh, actually doing my undergraduate degree here at Oklahoma City University, and was preparing for graduation and preparing for law school admittance. I had already taken my entrance exams and was going through gathering letters of recommendation when I was asked to uh, participate in one of our Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference Young Adult events. And at this event we were just um, trying to focus on listening to God's voice in our lives and, and just to hear that calling. And I was asked to give a, a brief testimony to compel other young people to take seriously um, this, uh, this calling that one might have. And after I, was complete, I completed that, uh, that little, uh, I guess you could call it a speech or presentation or a testimony, um, I went back to my room and I can remember things starting to click for me. Like while I was compelling other people to, to hear God's call, clearly and be obedient to it. I myself didn't feel that I was doing that. And so from that moment on, I said, well, I'm going to change the focus of my career. And at that moment, I decided to go ahead and uh, um, head to seminary, not, not requesting a church, not requesting an appointment, but just starting to go get my education so that I, I could become better at what I do. And it was during that um, that process entering the candidacy that the conference asked me if I would take a, a church and I said you know after a, a brief moment of disbelief I said okay I will and that's kind of what brought me here I can confess that when I went to that gathering of young people I had no intention of changing my vocation I had no intention. In fact, I can remember going through all the seminary booths, getting the free pens, getting the free candy, uh, free cups and things, and and um, I, I took them all back to my room and was gathering up all my stuff and said, well, God, look at all this good stuff I got. And one of the seminaries had a cup at that time, and on the back of that cup, it said, how will you answer God's call? And that's when it just, it all clicked. I said, oh, well, I really haven't. And it, it's at that moment I knew that getting into politics, getting into law would not be something fulfilling and because I would not be able to talk about the issues that directly affected us as a Native American community like I wanted to. So, so currently, you know, you have some, some uh, general 
church responsibilities. Right. Can you share a little bit about your current title and job responsibilities? Yes. <clears throat> Currently, uh, I'm appointed an extension ministry to the uh, General Board of Global Ministries, and I serve as the Executive Secretary of Native American and Indigenous Ministries. And what that kind of means is I do a lot of uh, educating of our general agencies, our denomination on the unique needs that we see within a Native American community, the needs of um, the kind of the, the things that we need to function in ministry. And so I do a, a lot of trainings, even um, we have contact with potential missionaries who, um, who are encountering indig indigenous peoples worldwide, and I kind of help them to, to see and educate them on what is it to be uh, in uh, kind of in, in a healthy form of ministry with indigenous peoples. And so with that, I also do a lot of administrative things with the uh, Global Ministries. I assist with some of the Native American Ministry Sunday funds and helping to uh, promote them and also to educate uh, the Native community on the possibility of receiving grants from that fund. You have some connections <coughs> with Shabon other than just, you know, through the, the Global Board of Ministries. Uh, it sounds like there's several different aspects and elements of your work. We do. Um, currently, we, we do connect um, partially with the Council of Bishops. And we are actually coming to the, the last, uh, the, the end of the, a two-year time period where we were working with the Council of Bishops to help them to follow up to the denomination's act, acts of repentance towards indigenous peoples. Um, so for the past two years, what, what I've been asked to do is help um, bishops, annual conferences, and local churches to develop a healthy plan of how do we engage and how do we acknowledge the, the history um, that has occurred between Christianity, uh, the events of history, I guess you could say, that have occurred between uh, Christianity and Native American people and we try to just help educate our denomination on what is it that we can do to acknowledge that, but also to kind of correct where history has gone wrong and how can we engage w uh, with our Native American community in a healthy way. In the uh, acts of repentance that you mentioned, Shabon, uh, and the reconciliation movement within the United Methodist Church is a major outcome of a journey that, that started earlier. Can you? Describe kind of what, what brought us to this point. Yeah, I'll say um, it's been a journey of several decades that has taken place uh, over the course of um, many events taking place within the life of the church. What we've seen historically is that as, you know, ever since probably around the, the 1980s or so, there's been a tremendous movement of acknowledging the impact of historical trauma, the impact of even Christianity on Native American communities. And as the conversation grew, we started to realize that the Christian faith, the Christian church, had a dual culpability in the, how shall we say, the history that Native peoples have experienced in the development of this country. And so as time went on, we began to debate and and the leadership in the Native American constituency began to debate what would it be like for a denomination to acknowledge some of the detrimental things that happened in history, to have an act of repentance, of coming to a new understanding of how can we become, uh, how do we engage in a healthy relationship with Native people. And so really this is the end result of a conversation that, that's taken place over you know, several decades share some of those I'll, I'll call them injustices that, that the Native Americans uh, are asking for repentance of? Yeah. Uh, early on in the, in the history of the Christian missionary experience with, uh, with Native American peoples, I don't believe that it was an entirely a, a negative outcome. I do believe there was some feelings of mutuality even in the first generations of missionaries we see, uh, how shall we say, a reciprocal understanding of learning languages. You see that kind of going back and forth with actual missionaries practicing indigenous languages, things like that. But as time went on, and history has, has proven this, as time went on, and really you kind of parallel it with the, the recognition of the massive amount of resources that were on this continent, land, uh, the ability to uh, uh, raise crops, things of that nature, um, as it was identified, 
that you see the purpose of missionaries starting to change where you start to see a more colonized understanding of what is it that we're here to do. Even John Wesley in his trip to Savannah had kind of a paternalistic understanding of how he was going to engage um, the indigenous peoples of this continent saying you know they shall be uh, as willing as little children to accept the gospel in all of its fullness you know this is well here you know never was the fact realized that uh, tribal groups here had a way of life, had a way of understanding, had a way of communicating, had a way of taking care of each other, had a way of, we had a way of communicating with what we considered the divine. And so when we ask the question, what is it that, um, what is it that we need to repent of as the church? The, the first two things was kind of the, the first thing would be the undermining of an, enti an entire way of life, uh, a way of living in a way that didn't um, exploit anyone, including the, the strangers into a land, didn't exploit the children, didn't exploit the women of the community in any way. We see a, a way of living that really supported every person who was a member of creation. So, you know, th the more specific thing that, that we look for is that during this process, now this took, you know, several hundred years, several decades. It was something that didn't just happen overnight. But what we start to see is this very kind of religious articulation was undermined, is that it was indoctrinated with these first few generations of missionaries that, well, this is not God's will for you to be different than a European Christianized type of person. And so this was actually taught to our people. Well, here's how you need to pray. Here's how you make this deity happy. And if you make this deity happy, then this deity will uh, give you all the blessings of, of life. And so what we start to see is that the very fabrics of an understanding, a cosmology of God begins to be undermined. And you might take that into the next several generations where then it became public policy <clears throat> to actually send our children to re-education centers where they're taught English, where they're forced to wear European style clothes, where they're forced to cut their hair, where you start to see those mentalities uh, of uh, indigenous identity being uh, literally beaten out of our, our people. And so this experience in itself is one thing that we can start to acknowledge because it wasn't just the government that did that. They did it hand in hand with uh, church volunteers, with church boarding schools in um, <clears throat> in, how shall we say that, they engaged in that process of assimilation to the fullest as well. Let me see if I understand. You speak of two, two uh, instances of, of abuse. I mean, one is the not taking a failure to consider and to accept Native American uh, cultural values, communal values, uh, and, and particularly spiritual mm -hmm. uh, forms. And was that because of this? kind of strict order of the Wesleyan theology and John Wesley had, he had, a, he had a, a seven step plan for everything he ever did. But was, was that part of what you're, you're saying there? Uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, and Wesley was not unique in his uh, understanding of how to engage Native American spiritualities, uh, Native American identity, is that this was something that just automatically took place as uh, how shall we say, the, the church began to grow, denominations began to grow here on this continent, that everything that was non-Christian began to be look, viewed upon as less than. And this goes all the way into, you know, even the first explorers into these hemispheres. You know, when we start uh, understanding concepts of the doctrine of discovery, we, we start to see the understanding from the very get-go in the justification of the taking of lands that were deemed non-Christian was, uh, was something that was giving divine approval from the leaders of the church, the pope, and also the leaders of the country, the, the, the monarchies. So 
from that point on, we, we, what we start to see is just this, this kind of paternalistic viewing of anything that's different. What we didn't view, you know, the, the Christian missionaries, what they didn't understand is that there were actual communities that knew how to pray. There were actual communities that did worship in spirit and in truth, that did do those things that were pleasing in the eyes of our Creator, in the eyes of God. But if it wasn't, if it wasn't done in the manner that the Christian church did it, then it was not acceptable. And so from the very beginning, those roots kind of took place that we started to say, well, if you're going to please God, then this is what you have to do. And, you know, we even see the effects of that type of understanding today where we see several, I'll just say internal conversations, but they're very spirited debates uh, where we inside our Native American community start to wrestle with what is it that God's asking of us. Um, so. It's fun. I've heard on several occasions that the, uh, the structure you know, of the, the church in, in terms of uh, policies, uh, organizational structure, decisions have been made you know, over many, many years, going back nearly 200 years, that have directly impacted Native American communities within the Methodist Church, but have not involved or engaged Native Americans in the decision-making process. Could, could you speak to that? I, I can. <clears throat> Through the history of our denomination, through our church, we have seen on numerous occasions that Native American communities were really the, the subject of, how shall we say, uh, missionary endeavors, our, our own missionaries. Now this is a little bit different than historical missionaries for, you know, we, we kind of send, uh, you know, circuit riders, people out to tend to the needs of our communities. Um, what we've seen historically is that decisions in numerous occasions were often made on behalf of Native people uh, with the understanding of, well, we know what's best for them. Uh, we, you know, this is ultimately, this is the only thing that's going to help them to become productive citizens in life, you know, to become good God-fearing men and women, uh, Christian people. Um, you know, those kind of decisions were made. But what's happened over the past uh, several years in the praxis of, you know, the practice of our denomination and our church is that we still see that it's almost as if we were wards of the denomination. Is that, you know, I've seen and heard conversations of Native American communities across the connection who have talked about here's our unique needs as a community of faith. And I've seen denominational responses through the annual conferences, through the structure to say, well, well we know those are your needs, but here's what we're going to send you. This is what you're going to get. You either take it or leave it. Uh, we've seen that type of understanding time and time again. And really what it's led to is just a lot of disenfranchisement, a lot of distrust of a denomination that, to be honest, we've had contact with as Native people since day one, since John Wesley came to this, you know, this continent. So. I think just in, in, a, in a nutshell, that's kind of what you see time and time again is that there's always a member out from outside of our Native community who comes in and says, well, this is what's best for you. Well, I think we can tell what's best for us. We've been doing it since we first came into creation of looking at what's going to be best for our people, what's going to be best for the children of our, our tribal communities, and what's going to be best for our elders. Is that, you know, the, the healthiest form of ministry will be those that are guided by the voices of the entire community. Siobhan, what, uh, and another question I had is, is I wanted to ask you is, is about, you may refer to uh, paternalistic attitude earlier, and, so, and I'm thinking mission versus missionary, and, and do those tie together in the sense of is there a feeling amongst the Native American community over the years that that instead of involving, engaging as equal partners in missionary work, they've been the mission. <clears throat> so the first part of that question again. In, in the sense of how Native American communities reacted to, mm -hmm. to being, uh, having mission done to them as opposed to the church taking an equal partnership and doing missionary work. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most uh, 
detrimental experiences in, in the history of Native peoples has been that type of uh, experience with missionaries of just people coming in and trying to convert. And, and really, I, when I ex express the history of, of Native American people, I don't always say that this was the healthiest form of conversion. When we look at the time of removal within the United States, you know, we think about pre-contact with European people. You know, millions upon millions of indigenous peoples on this continent. Several, several tribes, you know, we can't even count the, the languages that were spoken here, you know. You know, we see on the lower end estimates of 10 million, on the higher end estimates of 100 million native peoples here in what we, now, we would now call the United States during the time of removal. And that time means the Trail of Tears. When people were removed to Oklahoma, uh, the, the United States was expanding. That number was just over 200,000 that were left, a surviving remnant of millions upon millions of people. This was also the time that we start to see those boarding schools take effect um, in the mid-19th century, when we start to see uh, the church kind of uh, flexing its muscle within our community and expanding in missionary endeavors. And so when we, we ask the question, you know, what was it like when we converted? I don't really think we had a choice because we were in survival mode. And in several, in many circumstances, I believe that Christianity was forced upon us at the muzzle of a rifle because, you know, I don't know what the, um, percentage of the loss of our communities are, but I believe we did everything that we could to uh, sustain our way of life. And um, I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent, but you might, what was the question again? I'm sorry. We were just talking about uh, engaging in a, in a partnership role in oh. missionary work as opposed to being a paternalistic approach to, to mission. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry, Jerry. And so while that history exists there, that we're still kind of recovering from that experience because right now I do believe we are on the very cutting edge of a time of change where we are now coming in, into an understanding of how, to we, how do we engage in healthy relationships with our neighbor. You know, one of the things that, that we challenge today, especially in terms of the act of repentance of our denomination, um, just in, even in the pursuit of a healthy ministry with Native American communities, is that one thing that I ask is that if you're going to engage our communities, do you, are you demanding church membership? Are you saying, well, we're only, you can only come to our food pantry if your name's on our, our, our roll books? You know, the way I understand the gospel is that we are to be these, the embodiment of God here on earth to those that might fit our expectations and those that don't. And when we look at the, the long list of community ailments that Native American people are suffering through, there are numerous moments of entry where people of faith can walk beside us to help ease the burdens that this, this, um, this history has placed upon us. You know, when we think about the, 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 the suicide rates of our young people, the highest of any, per, any uh, group within the United States, when we think about the violence against uh, indigenous and native women, that nearly 50% of our women face some type of violence in their lifetime. When we think about, um, you know, the number of Native American children that are in foster care, when we think about all the health ailments, access to quality health care for Native people, there are numerous things that people of faith who believe that the gospel represents a message of living life to the fullest where they can enter into relationship with this. And so that's what I, I attempt to do is compel our sister denominations, our sister annual conferences, our sister churches to say, because we're going through this, you know, are, are you willing to walk with us? Are you willing to advocate for us? Or are you just gonna tell us what to think? And, and in numerous situations, we're still told what to believe. One example uh, of that would be a contemporary issue that we see with Native American mascots and our imagery being used in, used in sports arenas, 
uh, across the country where I've been to numerous places um, from Washington DC to Denver to here in Oklahoma talking about the need and demanding change for these type of mascots and in many such situations were asked well it's not it's not meant to be offensive to you rather, rather than hearing why it's offensive to us we're being told why it's been justified to keep those as opposed to hearing the actual concerns that we have of our children seeing these type of images all across the country you know even myself uh, as I was Growing up, you know, our, our particular high school was in a conference with a high school with um, a, a Native American sports mascot. And I can remember walking down the halls with bloody tomahawks images of, uh, of us scalping the other team um, just as normal. And there was no football, there was no basketball painted on these signs. That's all there was, was scalp the Indians. Now, during this time, I had a little sister who was... I think she was about four at that time. In no way did I ever want her to see such an image of her race, of her people being de demeaned in such a way. Now, I was old enough to know the difference, but our children aren't. That's the type of experience that those type of mascots lead to. But yet, to this day, we are still told, oh, no, no, it's for history's sake. We don't want those to be changed. And even one of those, the, one of the names that is used as a sports mascot, the, the R word, there's nothing good about that. Even documented throughout history, it is a derogatory name towards Native American people. No argument about it, but people still tolerate it in public institutions of education to be used uh, as a mascot. Mind you've talked about it, but part of your responsibilities is the acts of repentance. Mm -hmm. And a couple questions about that. First of all, we've talked about now some of the, the issues and some historically the roots of, of, of those uh, uh, injustices. What is it that we're hoping to be the outcome of the acts of repentance and reconciliation movement? <coughs> the hoped outcome of the act of repentance of our denomination is hopefully something that represents a healthy form of engagement of ministry with Native American people. Uh, something that is not detrimental, something that is life-giving as opposed to life-taking. So my hope from the act of repentance is this that there will still be a Native American presence within the United Methodist Church for many generations to come. Is that what I've, as I've met with annual conferences across the country, what I've told them and relayed to them is that we are at a turning point in history. A turning point that we can choose one of two directions to, to go into. We can affirm the needs, the presence, the vitality of Native American communities and do whatever it takes to be in a healthy relationship with those, or we can make a decision to ignore all the unique needs of our community and just start celebrating that we were a denomination that once contained an enormous presence of Native people because our time in the denomination is coming to an end. Is that when we see churches almost disappearing overnight, Native American churches, where we try to ask, oh, who's the contact person? What's going on with this? We haven't heard anything in months, in years, from this Native church. Things are, are very, um, how shall we say, in, in my opinion, scary, that, you know, we're, we're almost uh, on our last leg within the United Methodist Church. And so it is my hope that through education, through teaching of the history, through teaching of the unique needs that we have today within Native American communities, that now churches, annual conferences, and even our own Native American churches can engage in something that will be, that will be representative of the true spirit of God, of saying that we are full members of God's creation and we are in no means any type of mistake. Um, you know, one of the visions that 
that I have is that for Native American ministries or people engaging in Native Amer American ministries is that they have to recognize four components that we have ignored his historically within the Native American community. That's Native American spirituality, that's the role of indigenous women in our community, it is the the right to have uh, food and grow seeds that are indigenous to Native tribes as we see fit. First the answer is what, what's the, but what steps for the reconciliation movement to, to take okay. over and, and to be effective? What is the church going to need to do? And the second part of the question is what will Native Americans need to do? Okay. Is, the, is to continue to, number one, become engaged. The church has to become engaged in, in learning the education of the history of Native peoples in this country. And then number two, what will be the long-term plan? Is that in annual conferences right now, we see a tremendous push to say, okay, well let's do an act of repentance worship service, let's do a good liturgy over here, maybe we'll have a, a powerful speaker come in over here, and we'll be done. And then that's it. And the, what I've advocated for and told bishops, uh, the Council of Bishops, annual conferences, leadership uh, from annual conferences, is that when you do that act of repentance worship service, that's really just your first step. That's the first moment in saying, now, how will we engage a community that lives right next door to us in a healthy way for years to come? Like, like I said earlier, is that there are numerous points of entry where we can engage in healthy forms of ministry with our, our relatives that surround us. It doesn't matter if they're Christian or, or non-Christian. We're supposed to be the same type of loving, caring individuals, uh, members of creation, no matter who is on the receiving end of that. And so that's one of the ways is that what is the long-term plan? What is it that, uh, that you intend to do from here on? How will you be different now with the knowledge of education, the knowledge of this movement? We shouldn't be the same tomorrow that we were yesterday because we have a new understanding of what um, Native people have gone through. And that's an, the answer to that question of what is the long-term plan is not something that I can give them. That answer has to be birthed out of the local conversation that takes place between a local annual conference, perhaps a local church, and their neighboring communities. In one part of the state, it might be Cheyenne people, it might be Arapaho people. In another part of the state of Oklahoma, it may be Choctaw people, it might be Muscogee people. It just depends on that experience. In another part of the country, it could be Oneida people, it could be Navajo Diné people. That conversation will be unique to every one of those uh, places in the country. Javon, the, uh, how is the reconciliation movement in Acts of Repentance, how is it uh, connected to the Native American Conferencing Plan that's led by Nita Phillips? It is, it is not directly uh, connected. Sorry, I'm just, I had to laugh because I remember my answer from last time. And, uh, in my mind, I don't, I don't, I feel like I've already done that, I've already answered that question, so forgive me. Um, the Acts of Repentance is not directly related to the Native American Comprehensive Plan in that we've asked, did we ask the plan to give a response or to provide leadership throughout the country in follow-up to the Act of Repentance? It's not uh, directly related in that way. Indirectly related, they do have a role in it because members of the Native American Comprehensive Plan are members of the Native community. They have embodied the experience of surviving the, uh, the church. They have risen to different forms of leadership within the church, um, sometimes experiencing very traumatic um, conversations and even being treated in very, uh, how shall we say, uh, poor ways from denominational leaders, and they've survived that. They have a, ro a role in, in how do we become better at what we do in treating um, our community in a healthy way, treating them in a good way, and engaging them in a healthy form of ministry. I believe they have a voice, they have a place of educating our entire denomination. Um, so what we do is we try to look at how do we support their presence here? 
the, the members of the plant. You know, the, the plant itself does numerous uh, education events, uh, training events for the Native American constituency within Methodism. And every four years, we kind of have to go through a time period of, uh, how shall we say, nervousness and guessing on whether it will be renewed by General Conference. What I say is that we shouldn't have to go through that. If the Native American presence within the denomination is appreciated and wanted, it should automatically be known, okay, the Native American Comprehensive Plan is one of the primary catalysts for connecting with our Native American community across the country, that it should never be, we, we should never feel that it's gonna go by the wayside at any time because of how important it is in reaching the people across the United States. Taking a little bit different tack from it, what, what have been some of the successes over the last decades, the last couple hundred years, in, in terms of, of uh, the church working with Native American communities? Well, I'll I'll take that over the the past two hundred years, and I'll even connect it to today, because as sticky, as difficult, the act of repentance movement is, it's a step in the right direction. Is that a lot of the grief that internally we felt, you know, even my office has. Uh, been told about, well, it's not the right time to do this type of work. It's not the right time in history. They, you know, we were told racism is still going to exist within the church. You know, all these hard feelings are still going to exist. And the, tr the question that I challenged uh, persons is that, will it ever be a good time to engage in a moment of repentance? And the answer is probably not. It's never going to be the right time when everyone's feeling good about this is that this type of thing isn't that type of process. And so when you ask, what, what is something good that has happened over these past 200 years? I believe this is something good because it's finally, finally acknowledging what has happened in history to our people. And that as a denomination has never happened. And so while the event that occurred at General Conference in 2012, the act of repentance of the entire denomination. Well, it could have been better in some aspects, and you know, we could have been more inclusive in participation, you know, all those things. It was still the official voice of the denomination saying, we acknowledge that these harms occurred and we pledge to not do them again. Is that you have to put some credence in that. You have to put some belief in that because time was sacrificed, money was sacrificed, energy was sacrificed. Um, all these things were given for the betterment of, of our life, and I see that. And in fact, that's why I'm here today, is because I believe, I was instructed by my elders to have an understanding that everyone has the right to pursue spiritual wellness. Everyone has the right to be better tomorrow than they were today. And that's why I'm here, is that, you know, people want to say, well, we don't even need to do that. It's not going to change anything. But I believe it is. You know, five years ago, we didn't have annual conferences engaging in annual, you know, in discussions about what does the Native American community look like in our conference. Right now we do. Over 25 annual conferences are somewhere talking about how do we take this work seriously. How do we make sure we don't repeat the harms of the past 200 years? And so you ask me, you know, what, what good has happened? I believe this is good. I believe that we are better today than we were yesterday. I believe that there are annual conferences having those hard discussions with, with their community saying, what's it going to take to engage in something healthy? And so I believe right now we're living in the best of those moments. I'm going to lead you into a couple of questions, and you, you can answer them however you want, okay? Okay. But, uh, you know, first of all, the fact that the Native American community is here today, I mean, there's been successes, there's been successful evangelism efforts in the early 1800s, of uh, course, uh, was, was uh, removal uh, interrupted in, 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 uh, in Oklahoma, it's current day Oklahoma, up to today, and there's been successes that we can point to, and a lot of success was, was it due to Native American preachers? <clears throat> yes. When you look at, especially Methodism within the context of Indian Territory, what was to become Oklahoma, is that one of the successes was when indigenous native leadership 
was relied upon, pat native pastors of churches. You know, that's probably one of the keys to survival that I don't know if we've given enough uh, um, uh, acknowledgement to, is that the, the leadership that we were able to provide for our own people, our own communities, you know, we see name after name of leaders of even into modern history of, of district superintendents who had their own understanding and hopefully one day that we can even add a, a name of a Native American bishop into that um, into that list of leaders um, who have provided the the proper how shall we say the the, the proper uh, understanding of ministry for the general church and I think that's probably one of the most unique things that you see within the context of this area here in Oklahoma is that that was vital to uh, effectively reaching our, our community. You know, I even think back into probably the early half of the 20th century when we see actual speakers of our language, um, you know, thriving, our languages thriving in their respective areas of the state, you know, if we were to have a non-native person come into that that type of environment, I, w I would say it would have been very difficult to succeed for the long term. We would have been responsive, you know. We, of course, you know, we would have been respectful as we have always been to representatives of the Christian faith. But at the same time, to become the most effective, it has to be someone from the community. And I think that was one of the more unique um, components of ministry here. And that was even birthed into the modern history when we start to see different uh, leaders come in and talk about, well, now we need to have the ability and to have the rights to ordain our own people, which the conference did ordain, uh, obtain in the last half of the 20th century, where we were able to actually do that, to start going through our own ordination processes, the own question, our own questions of theology, our own questions of under, understanding of what does it mean to be a person of faith in the Christian movement? Um, we start to see that happening. And I think that's been something that has been vital to the, li the life of Native American ministries. On the end of the topic of successes, um, you know, we hear a lot of the independence and the movement about the uh, hear our stories, hear our voices, we're still here, see us. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still here 200 years later. I mean, you, you think of all the horrific events of removal and, and assimilation and Civil War and Reconstruction, the allotment, uh, taking away tribal authority, and yet they're still here. Can you, yeah. can you speak to that resilience and that spirit and that strength? Uh, I do. I, I can speak to that resilience. I do believe that it's because of the innate uh, characteristics of our, our spirit, our way of life, even some of our spiritual practices that have helped to preserve us to be here. Um, you know, we've gone through an experience where we weren't expected to survive this long. If you were to even study government policy of our presence here in, on this continent, government policy was formulated for us not to be here. That's partially why you see so much turmoil right now in how the U.S. government views what is a native, what isn't a native, what criteria do you have to follow, you know, on and on, is that those programs weren't geared for us to be here for the long term. Uh, and so, so we celebrate that today. In fact, we have communities that are doing the best that we can, thriving in life. Um, we may not have everything that we once had, but we still have something. We still have ways of praying. We still have uh, some of our speakers. But uh, I think that's something that, uh, that, that, that we celebrate. There's more to that question I want to answer, Jerry. Can you say it one more time? Uh, we just talk about the, the fact that there's still here and, and I mentioned yeah. that native voices are being raised oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and stories told said so we're recognized as acknowledged we're, we're here. And, and that's something we want to join the collective voices of tribes across the United States to help educate those that are non-native to help them to understand and see that we are truly still here. That one of the answers that I get when I'm engaging in the general church across the country is that oh we have no native people in our annual conference, so there's no need to, uh, to do this, there's no need to have an act of repentance. Every state has Native American people in it. They may not have a Native American church, they may not have a committee on Native American ministry, but there is a presence there. And the question that I ask is if the, um, 
if the lifestyle, lifestyles of Native people today are so difficult, there's so many things that we go through, why don't people of faith know what we go through every day? If our children are being harmed, if the women of our community are being harmed, if in some um, areas of Native country the life expectancy is around 50, much less than that of the non-Native community, if those things are going on, how come people of faith don't know about it? To me, I thought we were supposed to. You know, we heard stories in the Bible of Jesus leaving the 99 to go after the one. Today, Native people in the, in the United States make up 1% of this population. And I think it's time that we live out the gospel. So I, today, when we look at uh, our communities, we must say we have survived that. We have uh, gone through those moments, but we, sh we have still endured. And that's what my hope is through these conversations, is that we can see distinct cultures here with distinct languages. Even history has, has not done us a service, but a disservice in lumping all of our tribal groups into one category of Native American people, when we're just as diverse as anyone else across the, the world you know, in terms of languages, uh, religious art articulation, you know, our cosmology, our understanding, you know, uh, we, we're very different. And so it's our hope that po uh, persons throughout our church and throughout our country will start to see, here is the people around us. This is what they've gone through. And they're just as important as anyone else in our connection. Shimon, you mentioned earlier uh, some concerns that you have for the future of uh, Native American communities and churches, uh, particularly with the OIMC. Uh, what, what will be lost if we, if we lose our Native American churches? If we lose, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll voice this as not just if we lose our churches, but if we lose the presence uh, of Native American people within our denomination, um, we cease to be the church because no longer do we reflect the diversity of God's creation. We start to actually become our own it's not just a social club because that's not serious enough. We become our own uh, ex exclusive, exploitative, exploitative club of power that no longer represents the gospel of the Jesus movement that has attracted so many followers throughout the centuries of giving life to those who the entire world has turned their back on. We cease to stop doing that. And so we are at risk of not just losing a, a group of people within the denomination, we are at risk of losing our entire identity. Because what does it mean when Native people no longer are a part of a movement that we have been a part of since day one, since Wesley came onto this continent? We had a connection with this. Now, I'm not going to act like his ministry was successful then, because it wasn't. He didn't deem it successful. But we at least had contact with him. My ancestors, the Muscogee people, were the ones that he conversed with, um, you know, even had a, 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 a sign of respect with, uh, mutuality, uh, understanding. And so for us to have that long history here, what's that say about us when we have not thrived in a movement that we should have thrived in, you know? And certainly in the, uh, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, um, you'd think that that was our, you know, the, uh, uh, the I am with the Indian Mission Conference, not the OIMC, was one of the parents. Uh, could you say that of, of Methodism in Oklahoma? I would say that, and I would, I would definitely say the, the Oklahoma, or the Indian Mission Conference, the, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, whichever, you know, historical name that you want to give it, is the parent conference. We, we birth Methodism in this area and I think even a lot of our sister churches do not realize that we have a 
probably, let's see, a 67, 70, about a 70 year jump on Methodism here. And I think if we could just at least celebrate that fact, you know, it would help us to enter into a healthy relationship with each other. Well, look, you've answered this partially, but let me re ask the question a little differently. What do you say to people who ask, why do we need a separate Indian conference? Uh, you know, why not all, why, why not all Methodist churches being put into one conference? We need a separate Methodist conference and entity, number one, because of that historical nature, is that we are the bearers of Methodism into this area. Number two, the unique needs that we see in ministry, the, the needs of our community, the needs of understanding the role of historical trauma, the needs of understanding the role of indigenous language, indigenous women, food sovereignty, Native American spirituality, all of that is are what Native American churches should be thriving on, teaching, uh, helping our, our communities understand. Would we have that opportunity in a non-Native American church to go in there and to not just worship with our tribal hymns, but to lift up a prayer in the 30 to 40 languages that we have represented across the state of Oklahoma? Would we be able to do that? And my answer is probably not. And then when we start to look at the unique needs of leadership development, you know, on and on and on, the opportunities for our Native American young people, um, we wouldn't have that opportunity in non-Native churches. And I, I use my own life as an example of that. Is growing up within the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, I was the Conference Council on Youth Ministries president, you know, as my senior year you know, CCYM chairperson, planning our activities, that opportunity most likely would not have been afforded to me had I grown up in the Oklahoma Conference and some of our sister churches. Now, does that take away from our need to be in some type of relationship with each other? Absolutely not, because I believe we do. We have to be able to engage each other. I went to high school with numerous uh, United Methodists, and we had no idea that we were members of the same denomination until years later after we graduated. You know, I think I went back into one of the churches in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and I saw all my former classmates in there. Hey, so-and-so, you know, shaking hands, remembering. I didn't know you went to this church. I've been going to this church since I was 12, you know, conversations like that. So there is a need, but I don't think that should be at the sacrifice of Native um, churches. I do know that's a topic of conversation that's heavy on the hearts of our Native American people because the paradigms that we are forced to live in is that I'm not so sure we have uh, another choice but to let our churches go, but to um, join up with other Methodist movements. But the day we do that is what I say is the day we become more invisible in the life of our world is that there's more reasons than, than I can even count as to why we need uh, Native American congregations and communities of faith. Follow up question, what, what can non-Native American churches learn from Native American He's adding questions to that list, y'all, and y'all know that, that, that. What can Native American churches uh, specialists in different uniqueness and spirituality within Native American churches. What, what could, what could the, the non-Native American churches and, and, and members learn from, from Native American spirituality? I think, I believe that non-Native churches can learn so much from whether it be a dialogue, whether it be relationship, whether it be just living life together with Native churches. Um, Partially, the, the biggest impact that I could see on modern practices of Christianity today would be how do we in, uh, envision a kind of a interfaith dialogue with members of other, not just denominations, but other faiths, is that we do that every day within the context of Native American ministries because we have so many traditional beliefs. Some, some believe in Christianity, some don't. Uh, some believe in uh, maybe they're sun dancers. Maybe they, they go to Sweat Lodge. Maybe they're Native American church. Uh, and for my people, maybe they're stomp dance people. Uh, they come from that type of environment. Some of those do that by itself. 
we engage in that interfaith dialogue every, every day that maybe somehow we can have an impact on Christianity as a whole as we enter into this time where we see a growing separation between those who want to engage in a healthy way of those of other faiths with those that don't. We see that right in the forefront of our, our lives today. We can go home tonight and see it on the news. How do we engage that all of our communities in a healthy way, a way of respect, a way of never taking away the integrity of fellow members of creation? What about, as part of that question, Shimon, what about sacredness uh, in places, uh, communal aspects of the Native Americans, if you need the Native American that would, that would enhance our I believe that it would also have a profound impact in helping us to understand how is it that we worship, how is it that we pray, you know, how is it that we touch the Spirit of God in everything that we do, is that when you start encountering that in Native American communities, you know, it leaves us desiring desiring more when we just see a classical Christian form of worship uh, you know an hour an hour and ten minutes is that you know there are some places where prayers last over an hour in some Native American context where we see things people sitting up all throughout the night to to commune with the holy is that you know I think these levels of devotion can have a profound impact on Christianity. It would help us to understand, you know, oh, we can't tell the Spirit of God, well, we've scheduled you to show up within this four-minute time period of my schedule of worship, is that sometimes we've forgotten who is God, and we put a, a, a demand on this Creator being to say, okay, I'll be here at this time. If you don't show up, then this isn't a good church. You know, we see that every day when our pursuit for that holy presence should be every day. It should be a lifestyle, a lifetime. And that's what I see in Native American spiritualities and Native American churches. And hopefully maybe one day we can have a bigger impact on Christianity as a whole. Final question, I promise. Okay. What, uh, Mr. Bonner, what, is, what have we not discussed that, that you'd want to lift up, that you'd want to hear? Uh, non-Native Americans in, in, in the church in, in the Oklahoma Conference, uh, what do they need to hear? What, what would you, is there anything that we, topics we haven't covered, things we need to share, things, subjects we need to lift up? The only thing that, that I wanted to, to share is just the importance of this moment. I, I, I don't know where this work will go, is to help compel those members of the non-native community that in no way are we trying to point fingers, are we trying to uh, be detrimental to the life of the church. We're just simply trying to enhance it. We're trying to express uh, the faith of our ancestors, the faith of our people, um, and the power of that faith that has carried us to this day to believe in who God created us to be. And we hope that those members of the non-native community will walk with us in the things that we believe uh, that we need to be uh, voicing those things that we've seen in life and we hope that people will, will walk with us as opposed to giving us constant judgment and saying you don't need to do that uh, why don't you do this and instead of that um, just care and just walk with us one quick clarification. Um, everybody has mentioned at one point or the other that there was a name change in the conference, but nobody's actually explained it. So can you tell us what was the name of the conference? What was it changed to? Why was it changed? What's the significance of that? I might have to write a paper for that. Um, I can try to. Now, the, the biggest name change would be when we were uh, formulated into the missionary conference. Now, I believe it was in the, uh, the uh, 1970s when we were actually deemed a missionary conference, where the name of the OYMC was changed to the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. It was also at this point that we were actually granted representation on the general conference floor, where we actually had delegates from that point on. 
of having a literal voice in matters. Now, did it add up to the, the rest of the thousand of delegates? I, I, don't, I don't know. It was just two people, but it was a voice. Prior to that, we had no power. We had no voice. Um, and so you might think about, you know, how has the church changed in history for the better? That's a moment that it did. Now, early on, we did go through a series uh, of names, and we might have to have uh, Homer Noli or someone in here to, who can talk eloquently about that history because it was, was just deemed the Indian mission prior to uh, those days. Now, this, the term Indian mission goes all the way back to 1844 when I believe that the, the, the missionary endeavors amongst the Indi uh, Indian indigenous peoples here in Oklahoma were actually under the jurisdiction of, I believe, the Tennessee Annual Conference. It was, it was, it was structured much differently than it is now. And that's about all that I know. <laughs> Just tell me, because uh, you used the term OIMC again. Okay. Tell me what OIMC, what it stood for. Okay. Anytime we use the term uh, OIMC, it stands for the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference of the United Methodist Church. Is that this is it's fa a fairly new phenomenon, even though today we are entering into a new era where that name may change yet again. And then, what was it before it was OIMC? I believe it was just the Oklahoma Indian Mission, um, the Indian Mission. Um, I, we did not use a, I don't know if I can say that uh, accurately, uh, at least for the archives or anything. Here's what I haven't been able to get anyone to say, that it was went from being the Oklahoma Indian Mission Conference to the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. Why, what's the significance of that change of the three letters added to that? No, I can only say that the, uh, the three letters that were added, the, the difference is that it's a, um, an actual distinction of a missionary conference within the life of the United Methodist Church is that now you have the ability to not, oh, you have the ability to now minister to the unique needs of the missionary constituency whereas before you had to kind of uh, live under the paradigm of a regular annual conference which we don't have all of those characteristics, so it, it would have been very difficult to do that. So the, the biggest change was when it became a missionary, now we could start to, a missionary conference, we could now start to um, articulate a, a church that met the needs of the actual community. Linguistic needs, um, the actual numbers that may not be as large as an annual conference, we can start to minister to the, to the unique needs of that missionary conference.